Dr. Kave here for Alive. We're going to go in uh, portrait mode this time to talk about medical gaslighting, especially as it relates to anxiety. I had a couple patients recently where this issue came up and there's just so much misinformation about it that I was hoping to answer some questions and tell you about what really happens when your body has anxiety and you're going under anesthesia and how gaslighting that doesn't really acknowledge how real the anxiety is. So um, happy to see people coming in, Heidi and Sleepy G. Hello, everybody. Um, anxiety and gaslighting, right? So first of all, I want to make sure everyone knows what gaslighting is. I actually didn't know what this was until maybe like a year ago or so. I hadn't really, I hadn't come up, I hadn't encountered it. Uh, so gaslighting is when, for example, maybe uh, if it's doctor gaslighting or medical gaslighting, I'm kind of manipulating a patient and telling them that their symptoms are really all in their head. So we see this a lot for things like chronic pain, autoimmune disease, if uh, headaches, anything where we can't organically measure on a lab test or on a monitor. Like, I mean, remember, I'm here in an operating room, right? So we have all of like the ventilator, the anesthesia monitors. If we can't measure it, there's always a risk that we might gaslight it. I'm not saying most doctors do this. I think it's probably uncommon, but it can happen for things that we can't measure, depression, anxiety. So mental health, pain related issues can be gaslighted. Well, a patient I had not too long ago had severe anxiety before surgery. And let me tell you what went down because a lot of other providers around me were saying that, oh, their symptoms, which were nausea related, remember nausea is kind of hard to measure. You can't prove someone has nausea, so it's susceptible to potentially being gaslighted. Well, patient had severe nausea, but was also very anxious, and there was concern for maybe they were, uh, maybe their symptoms were just from anxiety or they were making them up. Well, remember what happens when you're under anesthesia and there's concern for nausea, right? Uh, you can uh, vomit out when you're under anesthesia. Usually breathing tubes like this one, we fill up the little balloon here so that it blocks off that vomit from going into your trachea and you have to make decisions, like in my case, what kind of breathing tube do I use? Do I use the one that protects the trachea because I'm maybe worried they really are nauseous, really do have um, a risk of vomiting, or are they just feeling nauseous before surgery because they're anxious? And that's what most people thought before we went under. You know, how do you prove it, right? How do you prove that someone has anxiety leading to nausea? What do you guys think? I'm really curious about what you guys, I'll tell you what I did and what ended up happening, which was absolutely crazy, but let's answer some questions and then I want to know what you guys think. <laughs> Have you ever been nauseous from being so anxious, like before you go under anesthesia? And this is a quick reminder, if you guys are appreciating me coming on here after a long day in the OR, do please hit that like button and share with others what you learned. Your support helps me do this more often. Um, Linda Dove, hey, good to see you on here. Ursuline, uh, universal mentality. Thank you for the kind comments. Um, Sleepy G's asking about why do surgeons wake you up in the middle of surgery? And Linda Dove is asking about chronic pain. We'll talk about both of those, but I do want to finish this medical gaslighting or potential gaslighting story because it just tells you so much about what are conditions that are at risk of being gaslighted and how there are risks associated with doing something or with not doing something, as you'll see in a second. Um, Teresa says anxiety can cause nausea and people still throw up from anxiety. Teresa, you're 100% correct. So this is what anesthesiologists have to decide. Are you at risk of still vomiting even when your anxiety is reduced under anesthesia? That's the question. Can you still be nauseous under anesthesia, right? So sailboat RN, uh, nausea vomiting was always an issue with me, but discussed it with the last anesthesiologist and there was prevention. Perfect. Very, very good. So here is how it went down. When I hear, so I call my patients the night before surgery, right? I hear their voice. You can tell a lot about somebody from their voice. This particular individual had a very hoarse voice, which is always concerning if it's hoarseness out of proportion to one's age or to their known medical conditions. So I had a concern that they had laryngo, uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux or like acid reflux, because what happens is 
if you're always having a little bit of vomit coming up, it burns your vocal cords and that can lead to a hoarse voice. So even just from the phone, I had suspicions about how much acid reflux do they have. Before we went under anesthesia, I did a nerve block on this individual. And during the nerve block, they got really nauseous and started dry heaving. But if you're nauseous to the point of vomiting, wouldn't you actually vomit stuff out? You probably wouldn't dry heave, right? So a lot of others are saying, oh, they have an empty stomach. Otherwise they would vomit stuff out, right? Wrong, wrong, because if it's a life or death decision, I'm gonna always take the most conservative route. I do it every day as part of my job. When you're on an operating room table like this one here, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not rolling the dice with anyone's safety. If it were my parents or loved ones, I wouldn't be rolling the dice with them. And I won't do that with someone else's loved one, right? So I didn't care how much dry heaving they had. When I hear hoarse voice, yeah, I make some heuristics and some like judgment calls. That's all what we do in medicine, right? We don't always have the answer. I can't measure your nausea level to see how nauseous you really are. I can't put an ultrasound on your stomach like you've seen me do for myself before. I didn't have that ultrasound available that day, which was my ultrasound's broken right now. So I'm getting a new one from Butterfly, which is cool, but didn't have it available to do it that day. So are they at risk of vomiting under anesthesia? That depends on, uh, let's see. That determines what breathing tube I use. Cause I always try to use the gentlest breathing tube that has the least side effects. It's this one called the LMA. There's a couple times that I can't use it though. And this is, <laughs> this is one of the big questions that I deal with uh, on a daily basis. Cause I always wanted to do the least anesthesia possible. Cause the least anesthesia means the least side effects. The least side effects like less nausea, less chance of chronic pain, dental damage, sore throat, nausea, etc. So I always want to do the safest amount and the lowest amount because that's usually the safest amount is the lowest amount, but it depends on the surgery always. So this patient was coming down to which breathing tube should I use? If they truly were at risk of being so nauseated because they had food in their stomach that might be vomited, you have to go for this breathing tube because you can inflate the balloon. Uh, if you want, I can show you what it looks like when it's inflated. Happy to do that. Um, Hey, Darian, good to see you, Tatiana. Oh my gosh, sorry, I haven't been keeping up with the questions. Almost done with the story. Then we'll do some question and answer too. So uh, I ended up doing this one. Long story short, I went the most conservative route. And then I did what we call dropping an OG tube. I don't have one to show you, but an OG tube is an oro uh, gastric tube. So I wanted to see, did they really have anything in their stomach? You drop the tube into their esophagus and you suck out. Nine out of 10 times, there's nothing there. You know, we're, cause like I said, we're usually conservative. And I was really curious, does this patient who's been dry heaving, right? Who is at risk of being gaslighted? Oh, your nausea is just from the nerves. You don't actually have stomach contents in there that increases the risk of aspiration. You know, so I, but I'm, of course I'm gonna drop it in there. I don't, like I said, there is a, risk, minimize risk everywhere possible. When you're in the operating room, like here, when you're with me, like we don't roll the dice. Anyways, what do you guys think? Did anything come out or is it an empty stomach and it was just anxiety driven nausea that didn't have a risk of vomiting? What do you guys think? I really wanna see if we, I wish I could do a poll here. I would be so curious. I pulled everyone in the operating room who was with me that day to see what they all thought was in there because most people think that I'm overly conservative because yeah I don't have a bunch of white hair yet <laughs> yes but people always like to make fun of you know the younger uh, physicians to be like oh well you're just being extra extra conservative what do you guys think so Susan Eagle thinks something came out Linda Dove thinks it was anxiety but Linda was it anxiety with real organic issues going on organic meaning like actually something in the stomach or was it just purely psychogenic without the risk of aspiration, which can be lethal. Aspirating can kill you on the operating room table, right? This is no, no joke. This is one of the risks of anesthesia. It can kill you. Susan Eagle, something came out, Linda, anxiety. Milica, hey, good to see you. Um, uh, universal mentality, nothing came out. Teresa, 
You can't still be nauseous and have nothing in your stomach. You can. You absolutely can. So many people dry heave after anesthesia. So remember, you haven't eaten usually. You haven't, you've been fasting for a long, for many, many hours. So, Teresa, you can absolutely be nauseous with an empty stomach. Uh, Michael Miller, definitely something came out. Or Michaela Miller, my, my apologies. Um, okay. All right, I got it. I dropped the OG tube, 100 cc's of green stuff. I actually, uh, I asked someone to film to see just how much stuff came out. There was so much green, bilious stomach contents that came out. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, you do it for one out of 10 patients. You do the more annoying breathing tube. Yeah, it's got some risks, but you save a life. And unfortunately, we live in a society where people have a difficult time assessing risk and benefit. But even if one in 10 patients is gonna have a potential aspiration risk, you treat 10 patients the same way to save that one. That's what, that's what I do when you're in the operating room with me. This is not a joke. This is the real deal where it can be life and death. And aspiration events are one of the most horrific anesthesia complications that often can be, um, that often can be prevented. Ursuline is asking, was it acid? I, I, I wish I could show you the video behind me right now. Maybe I'll do a dedicated video showing what it's like. I think it'll be really educational because so many patients think that we're making it up, that, oh, you can't eat after midnight. They think, oh, I'll have a sandwich for breakfast. No one's gonna know. Well, we do, we can tell, and you, would, you don't want us to find out because if we know that something was in your stomach, it means that it may have been vomited up and that acid burns your lungs can cause an aspiration pneumonitis and it's so not cool because no matter what I do with the ventilator here, I can crank up the oxygen level all the way. It might not be enough to get the critical oxygen you need to your brain and your heart can cause strokes, heart attacks and all that. And if we just gaslight patients saying that, oh, they're just nauseous because they have anxiety, we can run into the same issue. If you, know, you don't pay attention to, oh, they have a little bit more hoarseness than I would expect for that age, with their other medical conditions. Or their body habits, patients that have big bellies are more likely to have pressure pushing down on their stomach to shoot vomit up after they're asleep under anesthesia. So you gotta do heuristics when it comes down to life or death. I'm not judging anyone. To be very clear, I'm not judging, saying, oh, they're fat, or oh, they have a hoarse voice. It's not about that. It's doing what's safest. What I would want someone to do for my mom, or my dad, or my brother, or sister, or my wife, or whoever, because I don't roll the dice when it comes to stuff like this. Um, and this is what I do on a daily basis, and there's a lot of people that push back on me, but that's what anesthesiologists do. We have to do what's safest for the patient. Sometimes we postpone cases because we have that inkling, that spidey sense that something is not right. I'm not gaslighting anyone. I'm not saying that oh, it's all in anyone's head. No, absolutely not. If we do that, we run the risk of what I just described actually happening and not me preventing it by using a certain breathing tube and by um, dropping that OG tube. And just for reference, like 99% of cases, we just use this guy here. I know it looks kind of sus, but this is the most common one that we use for these surgeries and there's like 99% of the time, no issue. How do you find the one that is hidden in that you know cluster of things that could go wrong? That's our job in anesthesia. Uh, oh my gosh, so many stories that are demonstrative and educational that I would love to share. We'll get there one day. Catherine, good to see you. Always vomits a lot for hours, even days, green bile. Uh, Catherine, I'm so sorry. I, I hope that you know the, things, the three big things that cause nausea, especially after surgery, are the pain, the anesthesia and the pain medications, and the surgery itself, because that, um, Sorry, I repeated. <laughs> Sorry, long day in the operating room. Uh, anxiety, anesthesia medications, and pain medications. And pain, especially from the surgery, all those can contribute to nausea. Um, and that's also the intervention points. I have a couple videos, I'm sure you've seen them, on natural ways to help reduce nausea uh, after anesthesia. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Just another reminder, if you guys um, do appreciate me coming on here, do hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. And I also am a public speaker. I love to share the secrets about what happens to your body under anesthesia, because you have no memory of it, but it's so indicative of what your body has been through. The body keeps score. 
And that scorecard opens up when you're under anesthesia, connected to all these monitors and the breathing tubes and you're on that operating room table. You don't have to verbalize it. We can tell if you know how to look for it. And I actually run my anesthesia when I run it the way that I run it, which I believe is safest for patients. It is more, the body's more able to reveal these things about itself. Happy to talk about that as well if you'd like. This is your time now. I'm done sharing my gaslighting or not gaslighting story. Uh, you guys can ask questions. So, uh, universal mentality. What are other reasons you can die with anesthesia? Many, many reasons. The biggest one is from heart attacks and strokes and airway issues, like if we can't get the breathing tube in the right place and there's an anoxic brain injury or asphyxia. Um, are, are we going to questions now, Sleepy G? Yes. Uh, oh, Linda Dove says, Zofran doesn't work for me in surgery or in the hospital. So we have many other medications in addition to Zofran. Uh, you can see my videos on it, Linda, but dexamethasone, metoclopramide, or Reglan, uh, aprepitant are all used in addition to Zofran. Okay, Kayla, Kala, is having shoulder surgery for a rotator cuff repaired and she's so worried, Kala. I think it's a girl's name, I, I don't wanna assume, sorry. I'm so scared, how can I get ready for the surgery to lower my anxiety? Kala, you're in the right place because that's what we talk about on the Medical Secrets channel about your ability that you've probably never been told to help overcome anxiety in many ways naturally. So I think I just, published a video on this last week, Kala. Did you watch that video? My top three tips. The most powerful one being the curiosity of what happens to your body. Because curiosity and certainty are two of the greatest antidotes that we have to anxiety. They're all fostered naturally. Yeah, I can give all the midazolam and the Versed. I don't have them on me right now because I'm done for the day in the operating room for medications, but I can chemically sedate you, but you can't take these chemicals home in a goodie bag and you can still be anxious when you go home. So if I just squash out your anxiety with medications, not doing you any favors versus if you learn how to control the anxiety, which you can get a handle on even in vulnerable situations, like here in the operating room, looking at those lights and looking at me as the mask is going over your face. You know, there's a lot you can learn about your body because you have a lot of control over these things. Um, Teresa Lynn, the breathing tube looks like a baby stingray. It totally does, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Um, Darian, thank you for the kind comments. Do I use IG often? No, I, I don't use IG. I, I can't keep up with everything. I, I'm trying hard. Um, if someone wants to help me manage my social media, I would appreciate it. I just, it's been very difficult to manage everything with a busy OR schedule. In the clinic that I'm in the process of opening, I'm so excited to open this clinic. I, it's gonna really change a lot of patients' lives. I'm super excited. Uh, more on that later on. Maybe two more questions, y'all, and then we can... Um... Oh, Teresa said, I have gastroparesis and can eat nothing for hours. If I miss a dose of Zofran, things are not good. Oh no, Teresa, I'm sorry you have that. Does everyone know what Teresa, um, what Teresa suffers from? Gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is literally a paralyzed stomach, which is one of the biggest risk factors when you're under anesthesia for aspirating. So if I have a patient with gastroparesis, uh, we do not use the LMA, the Stingray. We don't use that. We have to use the more invasive one, even though it has more side effects like dental damage and vocal cord damage. I don't care if you're an opera singer. I cannot, in good consciousness, use this guy here uh, unless we verify that you have nothing in your stomach and. You could drop an OG tube in somebody awake to suction the stomach. Still does not uh, completely reduce the risk, unfortunately. Because uh, you just heard Linda or someone was sharing. Someone was sharing how even when they have an empty stomach, they can still bring bile stuff up. So this goes to show that an empty stomach alone does not rule out the risk of serious anesthesia complications. Uh, Susan Eagle why do patients not get a voice in the type of anesthesia and they're having a total knee and the surgeon only does general? How about like a spinal? Susan, good question. Does everyone here understand Susan's question? Uh, does everyone understand Susan's question? It's really important. Can you pick your anesthesia? Ah, I'll be right there. Um, 
All right, this will be our last question, Susan. Many patients can choose their anesthesia. I always like to give my patients the option, assuming that it can be safe with the surgery. Um, I'll end by saying when you have a total knee or a total hip, some surgeons um, might operate in a time scan, a timetable that takes, uh, how do I say this nicely? If it's not, <laughs> if the surgery can be done under two hours, I like to do as a spinal. If it can be done under maybe 90 minutes, it's really good for a spinal. But if it's a risk of going longer, the risk is that you have the spinal that wears off when you're on the operating room table and then you don't want to have a lot of pain. That makes sense. So I always give my patients the choice. Do it every day for nerve blocks, for spinals, for general, for um, even sometimes a type of breathing tube. Uh, sometimes I have a risk-benefit discussion with them to do what is best for them and what's best for patients is sometimes what they feel most comfortable with. It's always, this is why being a doctor isn't just like, you know, do it this way every single time. It's not just methodical in an algorithm because every patient's an individual and I treat them like that. Anyways, guys, I need to peace out here, but I hope you all learned something. This is a reminder, I am a public speaker as well and I really appreciate you all who refer me to organizations that you want me to speak for on the secrets of your body and what happens when you go under anesthesia. Uh, we talked about just a couple of those secrets today. There's many, many more. Um, so please keep the comments coming and share what you've learned with others. Until next time, remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told.